Uh, this is me, Dave Roberts, on the uh, the wonderful 107 Meridian FM. On the other side of the desk, I've got Mr. Derek Sheldon. Derek, good evening. Good evening, Dave. Great to be back with you. And what a show tonight. It is. It's a great show. We're, we're kind of honoured in a way because um, uh, our guest is uh, Mr. Peter Phillips. And Mr. Peter Phillips is the, the grandson of the legendary Percy Phillips, the guy who made the, the very first recordings of the Quarrymen, who obviously went on to become the Beatles. And uh, I'm really pleased to say that uh, um, uh, Peter, uh, he couldn't actually be um, uh, with us in the studio tonight, but he, I'm really pleased to say he's on the other end of the telephone. Now, technology willing, Peter, are you there on the other end of this line? We're not getting anything. Come on, thanks very much uh, for the call. Oh, that's better. We can hear you now. Sorry. Good. Hey, Dave, I have to say that PFM track you just played, man, I was loving that on the phone here. Oh, br- <laughs> I love PFM. That album, Jet Lag, you know, in the 70s, I, I couldn't get it off the turntable. Oh, brilliant. Well, that, that's, from a, what a band. that's from an album called uh, Chocolate Kings. Chocolate Kings, there yeah. you go, yeah. Yeah, excellent stuff. Great stuff. Oh, well, Not often you hear that on the radio. Well, n- uh, no, but we, we're, um, we're, we're, we're pretty eclectic on this show. Absolutely. It is, actually a, it is actually a new music show, normally, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, first two, uh, the first two tracks I normally play... Um, uh, I just, I just sort of, I get it's something to sort of, you know, get everybody warmed up and, oh, yeah. uh, and to wet your whistle, as Great it were. Stuff, yeah. um, Peter, well, we're about to talk about something a bit older. We are indeed. Um, on July the twelfth of uh, this year, it marks the uh, the sixtieth anniversary of the first Quarrymen recordings. Uh, the start of the, the starting pistol. It says here for the most important revolution in music in the twentieth century. <laughs> Uh, the centre of these celebrations is an exhibition on the 26th of August entitled the P- Percy Phillips Studio Collection, which is part of the International Beta Week, uh, giving fans, fans a chance to uh, experience firsthand a unique part of Liverpool's history. Um, Peter, now you're obviously the, you're obviously the grandson. Indeed. Um, how much of the you obviously weren't there at the time, but how much of the the, the kind of how much were you involved after that? So now, let's just, just get a little few things right. Well, right. What year were you actually born? I was born in 1961. Okay, so we're talking two or three years later. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Or what, what was, oh, two or three years after 58. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I grew up, like, in the studio in the house uh, during the 60s, you know, so I spent many a happy hour sitting on the counter in the record shop as customers came in and listened to discs. And then my sister and me had often run into the uh, studio, which had a, a two layers of carpet on the floor, and it was a wooden floor, and it was quite springy. And we used to grab the microphones, you know, and mime to records, and uh, bounce up and down on the floor, and the, it'd start flexing, you know, and the piano would start banging against the wall, and Grandpa would come in and uh, <clears throat> tell us to remove ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but well, yeah, I was in my mid-twenties when he died, Dave, and um, right. I knew him really well through my life, you know, he was a great fella. Yeah, well, I've, on the other end of the desk here, I've, I've, I've got Mr. Derek Shelmerdine with me, oh, and uh, uh, Derek is, uh, Derek's written a book called uh, The Rock and Roll Un- Unraveled, which is uh, oh. uh, sort of an encyclopedia from the mid-forties to the late seventies, all about music. Uh, oh, it's yeah, it's yeah, a fantastic, it's a fantastic book. Um, Derek, uh, if you, you won't mind me saying this, will you, Derek? You're a tad older than me, aren't you? Absolutely. <laughs> what, you will mind, I, I, or you are old? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, Hello, no Derek. I don't, hi, hi, Peter. Great to talk to you, mate. Indeed. Yeah, I, I, I was born in 48, so I sort of oh, lived, well. lived, lived through this um, whole era. And I, I come from, uh, not Liverpool itself, but just about 20 miles away, uh, just over the, uh, the Welsh border. Oh, so yeah. Liverpool was a stomping ground. We used to go to uh, the second half of the all-night of the cavern at times. Oh, so it was, stuff, yeah. It, it was so a you have some, lots of memories of, uh, of these old recordings. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you were a, a denizen of the cavern. <laughs> yes, we went there once or twice. It was, uh, it was pretty good. Because it's funny, you know, Derek, and, and you'll remember um, much better than I, I, I can, but... That period of time, right, from, say, 1955 through to 1962 or 3, yeah. it, was a, it was a cultural revolution, wasn't it? You know, when you oh, think absolutely. about it, the, you know, for centuries, the young boys and girls, when they became uh, teenagers, you know, they followed in the footsteps of their mum and dad, didn't they? You know, in their dress, in their Absolutely. Jobs. We were the first, first generation of teenagers, basically. Yeah, you know, something happened during those few years. Yeah. And they all suddenly, you all suddenly decided... 
no, let's create our own stuff, man. Let's make our own music and fashion and Absolutely. let's write plays, let's write yeah. poems, let's paint, make films. What, what happened? Was it Chuck Berry, do you think? Well, I mean, he, he was a great, uh, great influence. But it's interesting, the, uh, the British rock and roll scene very much grew out of the Skiffles scheme Aye, uh, of, the, uh, of the mid uh, 50s. Because yeah. I, I noticed um, reading uh, your website that a guy called uh, Tony Allen uh, with yeah, the Blue Mountain right. Boys is one of the people that you recorded in 56. Right, yeah. Tony's still around, actually. God bless him. He's a, he's a bit ill at the moment. But oh, the, right. He's doing all right, yeah. Excellent. And he was he was uh, used to live up the road from Grandpa, and I've spoken to him, you know, and he's told yeah. me his story about uh, making a disc in there in 1956, I think he made it. He yeah. claims it was like the first rock and roll recording, you know. That's right, with his acoustic that's right. guitar and his pal. Yeah, the date's given on the website is either 27th of February or the 27th of uh, March, but it's That's right, he kept records in his Navy logbook, yeah. Yeah, because it was interesting, because... Uh, your grandfather started out as, um, as selling and uh, recharging batteries, didn't he? That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, what happened was, uh, Derek, that in 1925 he opened the battery business. Yeah. And um, after the First World War, um, he got badly injured in a gas attack in France. He ended up back in Liverpool and he, opened, he, got, he took over the uh, proprietorship of the rally dealership, the rally bicycle dealership. Yeah. In, Kensington, in the Kensington area, Brunswick Road. Yeah. And um, over the, uh, the next couple of years, he started getting motorbikes in as well. Yeah. And that was when he first came across batteries. And he thought batteries were incredible. He told me this whole thing about, he had this fascination with electricity and batteries. And, you know, then, no one in Liverpool had electricity then. Yeah. You know, I'm sure no one in um, East Grinstead did either. <laughs> And if you I'm had sure anything electrical, <laughs> which most people didn't, maybe people had a radio, yeah. you had to have a battery to run it off, you know. And so um, he became fascinated by batteries, which is what led him to open the battery charging service. Yeah. And then for the next 30 years, that was his life. And Grandma Hilda, she ran a, a boarding house on the upstairs, two rooms upstairs. Oh, right. Where actors from the playhouse had stayed. Yeah. And then... Um, so over the next 30 years, that was that was their life. You know, they raised me dad and his brother, Peter. And um, on they went, you know. And then in 19, after the Second World War, as you'll probably know, being from around there, and when you were a little kid, the place was uh, several piles of rubble, wasn't it? Absolutely. Liverpool was devastated. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. half demolished. You know, when John Lennon and Paul used to go down uh, into the city when they were little kids... <laughs> It was a huge bomb site. Absolutely. You, know, you couldn't go shopping as such. Well, the bombs, the, the docks were heavily bombed, weren't they? Yeah, and the city centre. If you look online, yeah. some of the photos of uh, Lord Street and the yeah. Victoria Monument, it's, it's absolutely shocking, you know. Absolutely. So anyway, um, so when they started rebuilding Liverpool in their 50s, uh, they electrified the place, you know, yeah. so batteries were, were less useful and people had more electrical devices then as well. Even tellies came in, you know. And so, um... The battery business kind of faded out, and he, because during the war, Derek, he'd be, he used to go to Burton Wood Air Base a lot. All oh, right. It's just on the outskirts of yeah. Liverpool, and um, he used to char uh, supply batteries for them during the war. So, and he used to go to dances there at the Skyline Club, you know, of a yeah. night. And um, he used to love it. Uh, the dance bands he saw Harry James there and uh, Glenn Miller, you know, and um, and so. He started getting boxes of records that the, that the American uh, airmen had bring back. Yeah. So he opened a record shop, Brilliant. and it became uh, from 1954, next couple of years, uh, like a centre of you know culture, if you like, yeah. in uh, in Liverpool, wherever you want to go to get the. Peter, Peter, what was the uh, name of the record store? Well, it was still called Phillips Battery Charging Depot. And a sign never went up, giving the record shop a name. Oh, I see. It just, uh, became but, pe known. but people did actually realise that records were for sale in the store. Yeah, yeah, it was just referred to as, we'll go to Phillips to get some records. Yeah. And then in 1955, he was uh, 60 years old, and um, he suddenly had this brainwave. Me grandma remembers, said, oh, Percy had a brainwave. And me dad at that time was working down uh, in Hayes for EMI. He was training up to become an electronics engineer. And um, so Grandpa went down to visit him. And then while he was there, he spent uh, £400, 1955, that was like a year's wages. Year's wages, gosh. On uh, this, this studio equipment, an MSS um, 
reel-to-reel tape recorder, amplifier and disc cutting lathe. Brought it back up to Liverpool with me dad and they installed it. And uh, for the next 15 years, he cut discs. Why? Well, I, I mean, why? I mean, I, I guess the Beatles. Well, the, I'm calling the Beatles the Quarry Men. They came to you. Is it p- purely because there was nowhere else to go? Well, there certainly wasn't in those days. There were, the, you know, it, how he had that idea, I don't know. You know, he must have. He got it from somewhere, but um, he never, never told me how he. You know, he just said it was a brainwave and that he should start cutting these discs. Maybe he saw an advert in the paper or something, and because he was selling records, you know, and the battery business had gone, so. But, um, yeah, he used to go on location as well. He'd take the tape deck out and he'd record choirs and weddings he used to do a lot of. And in the, the first few recordings, uh, Dave and Derek, the ones that he made in 1955, 6, uh, 7, are, are things like family messages. Yeah. I've got 70 recordings which he had kept at the end of the studio's life in 1969. He kept this box of his favourite discs, you know. So there's 70 of these recordings ranging from the first disc he ever cut, mm. which was a recording of himself singing unaccompanied, singing right. Bonnie Marie of Argyle, yeah. which um, is very enjoyable. And then uh, on the side two of that disc, he, he sings along with a, a local dance band singer, Betty Roy. They sing Unchained Melody, you know, which was a hit of 1955. Yeah, and as you know, a lot of people have covered it since. Absolutely. But it's very beautiful uh, to listen to, you know, it's very atmospheric. Does um. Did, you, did your granddad tell you any stories about the actual day that uh, John that the Paul, Quarrymen came? That the Quarrymen came in. I mean, did it at the time? Did it actually? Did he actually feel anything different, or did he just think, no, three other lads, they paid their dollar, as it were. I'm, I'm making a living. To come on in, do whatever you want, kind of thing. Or did he? Did he ever say to you, it, it, it felt like something different was happening here? No, no, he didn't say that. No, the, the only different thing about uh, the Quarrymen to Grandpa was that they had a drum kit. Their drummer, Colin Hanton, who'd been in the group since it started, he had a drum kit, which was quite unusual in those days. Because, yeah. Derek, you were mentioning Skiffle. That's right. And, of course, when the Quarrymen started, um, they were a Skiffle group. That's having right. Having been inspired, as you said, by Lonnie Donegan yeah. and the uh, Rock Island Line. But um, by the time 1958 came along, they formed the group in 1956 at uh, Quarry Bank Grammar School, where John went. That's right. And... Um, he had various of his pals in the group for that year, and they were playing skiffle with THS bass and a washboard and what have you. Yeah. But uh, in 1957, uh, later in the year, Paul McCartney joined, and then in the beginning of 1958, George Harrison joined. So yeah. they then had the John, Paul and George Colin on drums and John Lowe on the piano. Yes. And so they started, you know, they'd heard Elvis by then, and they'd heard Chuck Berry. Yeah. And, you know, th- they were becoming a bit more rock and roll, so yeah. that first recording they made, that'll be the day. Obviously, they'd loved uh, Buddy Holly, and it's got a kind of edge. When you listen to it and you hear John singing, it just, I think it sounds fantastic, you know. Yeah. And 60 years ago, today, yeah, absolutely. you know, just the Beatles, man, what a story, you yeah. know. I'll tell you what we do, what, what, what we do, Peter, as you just uh, mentioned it, uh, should right. we, we hear it? Oh, go on, yeah. Here we go. We'll all enjoy uh, that, This is the, sure. the Quarrymen. And was, this the, was this the first track that they cut? Because they cut yeah, two in the Yeah, they cut day. it direct to disc as they played. Yeah. Grandpa so this is lowered this... the cutter onto the blank acetate and cut it as they played it live. So this is John just... John Paul and George this on is, acoustic This is guitar. just live then? Yeah. Here we go. Well, we got there in the end. Uh, the Quarrymen there with their uh, their direct acetate version of uh, Buddy Holly's uh, That Will Be The Day. Uh, any idea what happened to that acetate, uh, Peter? Yes, uh, there is a story connected to it. In fact, all the discs um, in my collection have got a story. It's, it's amazing, really. But this particular one, um, you know, 60 years ago today, the, how does it sound? Sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yes, um what did you ask me, sorry? Oh, what happened? Do you know what happened? Oh, the, the acetate, acetate, yeah. yeah the acetate. What happened was they took it away and they had it for a week each and then um, John Lowe, the piano player, got it last. He kept it for 23 years um, in a drawer in his house. And um, in 1981, he was going to sell it at an auction house and uh, Paul McCartney bought it off him. So um, it's now in Paul any, McCartney's any, record collection. Has Paul still got it? Yeah. And it's said to be the most valuable record in the world. Oh, I bet it is. What, yeah. Any idea what Paul paid for it? Well, I wouldn't know that, no. Ah, it'd be a private transaction, I'd say. to ask John Lowe. <laughs> 
One of the things John Lerrell be at our exhibition actually. He's coming oh, up to, uh, to support us as well. Yeah. Did um, Percy ever think of going down the same route as Sam Phillips in America with his uh, Sun Records label and actually sign the artists up? Did he have? Did he not fancy getting into the sort of management side? At oh, all? It's funny you should say that because um, it is an amazing coincidence that they were yeah. both called Phillips, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And um, here we've got Sam Phillips. I think he opened at Sun Studios or Memphis Recording Service. That's in right, exactly the same. But he was, of course, he was recording mm. Roscoe Gordon and, uh, you know, Billy Blue Bland and all those guys. That's right. And he recorded the first ever rock and roll record, of course, that Ike Turner, uh, Jackie yeah. Brinston and the All Cats, wasn't it? That's right. Um, rock and 88. 88. Yeah. There you go. And, um, of course, he was a young fella. And, yeah. and, and after all, and um, Howlin' Wolf did his first uh, record there, I think, B.B. King as well. Yeah. And then along came Carl Perkins and um, Elvis, of course, and Johnny Cash. And, uh, That's right. And uh, he became successful financially as well. But as you say, he signed them all up, you see, because he was a young fella and he yeah. loved it, didn't he? Exactly. He loved uh, the, whole, the whole thing of uh, making music and recording it and marketing yeah. it and making these guys successful, you know, helping yeah. to make them. Cause he but his grandpa didn't have those feelings yeah. for rock and roll. He was, uh, you know, he was 60 years old. In fact, when the Quarrymen came in, he was 63. Yeah. Uh, you know, John was 17, nearly 18. Right. The others were younger. How must grandpa have appeared to them? In yeah. fact, when I met Paul one time, he was telling me that they used to call him Grandpa right. because uh, he seemed so much older than them. Well, he was. Well, he then. was, yeah. That's perfect. It, it could have been interesting. He could have had an, uh, a relationship with someone like uh, Sam Leach, uh, who was one of the biggest promoters at the of the time, because it was really before uh, Brian Epstein got into the uh, Indeed, yeah. into the game, and it, there would have been a really interesting relationship there. Yeah, imagine it. Yeah, I have I have wondered about that uh, over the years. Yeah. yeah. Although Brian was a regular visitor, because as you know, he had a record shop in Liverpool. That's right. And, and he used to come up to. He used to sell sheet music as well, and. Yeah. Know EMI's catalogue and what have you. Although Grandpa had quite a bit of EMI's catalogue as well, but he had all these one-off recordings that he got yeah. from America. Yeah. So Brian used to come in to listen to them, and he'd also come along because they'd have parties up there in the evening after playhouse performances. Oh right! And as you know, Brian was a big fan of the theatre. That's right. So he'd often come round and yeah. uh, have a, at some of these parties. Yeah. And then when he signed the Beatles, Brian. He used to come and get Grandpa to record all their radio appearances onto tape, oh, and then put them onto disc for Brian to listen to uh, at yeah. a later time. You know, yeah. we've got um, uh, Peter. There's also other stories. Obviously, there's other artists uh, who came along and uh, mm. people like Ken Dodd, that sort of thing. But there was uh, there's the kind of the the I would say dubious one of Billy B Billy Fury coming along, but nobody actually knows whether it was him or not. As what does, what did your your Grandpa ever say about that? I've, n I've never heard that story before, Dave. Well, um, perhaps, d perhaps Derek could uh, sort of enlighten us a little bit more on sort of dates and times and things. Go on. Well, it, it's just that um, there's an uh, interesting uh, date of 18th of uh, April, 58, yeah. uh, where uh, Billy Fury uh, came in. But some Billy Fury biographies put the date in, uh, in May. May. Yeah. And I know reading your website, you, you said that there's uh, no... Uh, matching entries for uh, for May. That's but correct. Yeah. In 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 the in the, uh, the log, Percy apparently wrote "Youth with guitar, yeah. one ten inch double sided disc," which sounds <laughs> great. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I love some of the entries in that log. Oh, absolutely. So amusing, you know. But is, is there any? You know, did he ever say it was? Yes, it was. Well, no, he wouldn't have remembered uh, Billy Fiore from a no. hundred other guys who would have come in. You know, well, even though right. it is really good. That so 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 it's, so it's still a little bit up in the air as to whether it was or whether it wasn't. Well, I suppose you could say that, but, you know, Gene, his mum, who I spoke to a few times, and his yep. brother, Albie, unfortunately, both uh, passed away now. They uh, they both thought it was in April. Yeah. And, um... But, so, so yeah. Billy Fury did definitely make recordings there. It's just oh, a question no of when. about that. Yeah, you yeah. can... We've mm -hmm. got the disc, haven't we, that, yeah. um, the disc is in existence. Well, it's it was on display, actually, not long ago at yeah. Liverpool Museum. I mean, and it's uh, a double-sided 10-inch uh, 78, yeah? yeah, when Billy's written, the, or Ron Witchley as he was at the That's time, right. he's written by hand on the, on the label the five tracks that he recorded, yeah. and that disc then went on, of course, to get him a, a contract with Larry Parnes. 
That's right, that's the one he took to the Billy, the, uh, Marty Wilde show, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, he, he took it with the idea of right, trying yeah. to get Marty Wilde to sing them, and Larry Pond said to him, well, why don't you go on stage and sing it yourself? There and that's how Billy Fiore got yeah. his start, wasn't it? And he was our first proper moody rock and roll star, wasn't he? Oh, without a show. You know, we had doubt. Tommy Steele and yeah. Cliff, who were, uh, like, a bit cheesy, weren't they? Yeah. As great as they were. Yeah. But, you know, Billy Fiore, he was proper moody, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> he had the rock and roll image. <laughs> yeah. But the thing about that music we were just listening to, actually, it struck me at the time, uh, that'll be the day. How the intent of the guys, you know, they really mean it, don't they? Oh, absolutely. You know, what was going on there creatively in Liverpool, you yeah. know, in the... 1958, I and mean, in 1957, Johnny Guitar had gone in there, who later it's became uh, the Rory Storm and the Hurricanes guitarist, you know, yeah. with Ringo. Yeah. And he recorded their little Richard song, She's Got It. It's like That's one right. and a half minutes of this blast of rock and roll on acoustic guitar. Because yeah. yeah. a lot of that early rock and roll, including Elvis, was done on acoustic guitar, wasn't it? And well, piano, you know. Absolutely. Nobody was playing electric guitars yeah. till the end of the 50s. And there were no bass guitars either. Ah, You'll you find go. most. But it still sounds like really fat. And absolutely. exciting, doesn't it? Yeah, you know? absolutely. How much of an engineer was uh, was your granddad? Did, was he kind of, you know, did he sort of make it up as he went along, you know? Well, I think in those days, you know, I, ref I refer to him as a pioneer, Dave, because, um, you know, he was born in 1895. Ooh. Yeah, so when he was born, there were no... Well, there were telephones, actually, because they'd been invented just uh, a few years before. Mm, but, yeah. you know, things like radios, record players, electricity, aeroplanes, televisions, rare. none of this had even been invented, you know. And during the first 50 years of the 20th century, you know, when Grandpa was growing up, all these things were appearing, like, almost every year, you know, the, the first transatlantic radio broadcast, the Morse code, you know, and then the first uh, wireless radio and then the car appeared on the streets, you know, and it just, it was insane, you know, it, in science as well, all these yeah, Technology was moving made. along at a heck of a rate, yeah, wasn't it? And yeah, and all these pioneers like Marconi and these guys, yeah. you know, to him, they were the current celebrities, if you like, and they inspired him, I think, to get this interest. You know, when he first heard a radio, I remember him telling me, he said, um, I sat there and we switched it on and this voice came out and he straight away went round the back and took the back off and he wanted to know what was going on. You know, it was connected to a battery, of course. Yeah. There was no mains electricity. Oh, isn't that a wonderful yeah, thing? Yeah, and there it's was a great image, isn't valves it? in the back, you know, vacuum yeah. tubes yeah. that we used to refer to as valves. Yeah. And a speaker. and a, You know, it, all that technology, Dave and Derek, if, you know, John Lennon would never have heard Chuck Berry in 1954 or 5 or whenever That's if right. someone hadn't invented the record player and the radio and the microphone and the, the cabling. You know, all that stuff got invented. It facilitated that technological revolution, if you like, facilitated the cultural revolution that then happened. You know, during the sixties, didn't it? You know, yeah. which and the Beatles sort of epitomised to me. You know? Yeah, and I think the fact that uh, your grandfather actually had the record shop with the American imports. Because in those days, it was, un unless somebody had a connection like that, your regular uh, record shops did not stock uh, oh, American right. uh, imports. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's where the, uh, uh, British rock and roll was, was all American covers in the, yeah. certainly in the, uh, in the 50s. That's right, isn't it? And, uh, I always think of that, ain't that a shame by Pat Boone, you know? Yeah. I can hardly listen to it. Yes. When you hear the original, you know, and the piano yeah. on the original, wow. Yeah. Little Richard. What a tune. Yeah. What, um, domino, wasn't it? Yeah. when the quarry men went into the studio, what, what were they paying? Well, uh, the price to record, go in the studio, set your gear up. They set up uh, three of them standing round uh, one microphone on a stand. John at the piano against the wall, Colin at the back next to the fireplace. And because um, it was just a living room, you know, yeah. with a sash window and a door and a, a fireplace, about 14 foot square. And um, the quarrymen started playing. And, um, you know, they, they got asked to pay 17 and six, which was the price to record onto tape. And then if you'd done a nice job that you were happy with, Grandpa had then cut it to the disc. But it turns out that day the boys didn't have 17 and 6 on them. So they opted for the 11 and 3 service, yeah. which was to play, as we were saying earlier, Absolutely. directly onto the disc. Yeah. In fact, in spite of all the danger which you played a clip of there, they, that's on the B side. I'm going to play it later. Aye, right, well, that, that's yeah. it. Kind of historic in a way as well, yeah. because it's the first original song that they ever put on a record yeah. 
You know, if we think, Dave, that um, that record you just played, that was the first time John, Paul and George had ever stood in front of a professional studio microphone. Yeah. Yeah. It was the first time they ever made a record. Yeah. You know, think what they went on to do with the Beatles and in their exactly. solo mm. careers. Yeah. That was the first time they ever did it, you know. Exactly. And it was Paul and George that wrote In Spite of All the Danger, yeah, wasn't it? Well, Which is interesting. Thing, that's the only song in the whole of the Beatles canon yeah. that is credited to McCartney Harrison. Yeah. You know, I think Paul wrote the song and um, George played that uh, great guitar solo that's on right, it. That's right, so he included so he him. gave him a credit, yeah. The, um... Sorry, Dave, the, the, I was going to say... The, the, so they paid 11 and 3 anyway. Yeah. Yeah. The building itself, um, is it still there? Yes, it's in this terrace of houses on Kensington. It's just up the up the hill out of the city next to Liverpool uh, Royal Hospital. And the building's still there, yeah. It's got a blue plaque on the wall. It's now owned by a landlord who rents out the rooms. Oh, right. And the, the blue plaque got put on the wall in yeah. 2005, commemorating the fact that the quarrymen made their first record. So, so, so it's just a normal, it's just turned into a normal house now? Yeah. And you get the odd tourist going past there, uh, taking photos. Yeah, yeah. Why do the blue plaque people seem to think that the date was in a couple of days' time? Oh, have you spotted that, have you? <laughs> I, I just, spotted any other mistakes? Well, the 11 and 3, they seem to think he, they paid the full 17 and 6. Ah, yeah, well, that's the story, isn't it? Yeah. I think uh, what that is, it's Paul's story, that, because he, he told me they paid 17 and 6. The others aren't that sure. Yeah. In fact, Qu uh, Colin Hampton, the drummer, who was in the original Quarrymen, the first time John formed the group in 56, and um, he's published a book recently called Prefab which is his memoir, you oh. know, of those days. Yeah. And he tells, he gives a really good uh, telling of the story of going to the studio that right. day. But he doesn't mention 17 and 6. In fact, he doesn't mention the, the price, I don't think. Yeah. And they, But Paul insisted it was 17 and 6, so they came again. The Beatles came back to the studio to make a record in 1960. There was just John, Paul and George with their acoustic guitars again. Yeah. And uh, they stood around the microphone and cut one side of an acetate um, of one after 909 oh, right. that John had written, you know, years previously. Yeah. And um, that acetate has never been found, you know, no one knows where it is. No. But on that occasion, they will have paid 17 and 6, because, and that, Grandpa remembered that occasion as well, because they were a bit better known by then in Liverpool. Yeah. So he, 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 can t he could tell that story about when they came back, the three of them, and paid 17 and 6, um, record the tape first yeah. and then he cut them a single sided did, did, presumably the tapes were written over were they or did yeah, the tapes well, exist imagine as well? imagine dave mm. if it, you know he was open for 15 years how big would the warehouse have to yes. be if he uh, kept yeah. all those tapes and exactly. most people just wanted one or two maybe five copies yeah. of a disc and then you wouldn't see them again you know the, exactly. so he used to have sessions regular sessions i remember them throughout the 60s as well was it, was when it, he was just wiped tape yeah. Was your granddad uh, a guy that actually went out and saw bands play? I mean, would he have gone to see the Quarrymen play anywhere? No, I'd say definitely not, no. Unless he was at a wedding one time that uh, they would have played at, because that was the sort of gigs they were doing at that yeah. time. Yeah. Did, I mean, did, but no, he was more of a... He, was, he loved Hank Williams uh, on the oh, radio, right, on yeah. record, but it was his dance band he used to go... There was a, 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 a dance hall called uh, the Grafton Ballroom, just up the road from Kensington, and um, he used to go there all the time. Did um, I mean? Did, did did he? You know, did he develop a friendship with the like, with um, with them all? No, no, not really. No, George became a friend of Carol. There uh, is my auntie Carol, Percy's daughter, and um, he used to write her uh, quite a lot of letters. We've got some actually, which will be on display at our exhibition in August. He he wrote uh, one of the ones we've got. He wrote for Cat to Carol from the Star Club in Hamburg in uh, 1962, and he's saying. Uh, Oh dear, Carol! Um, lovely to see you at the cavern the other night, mm. and um, and then he says we're coming back to England next week to do a TV in Scotland. <laughs> so you know they were just on the rise. So uh, those will be on display. So yeah, George was a, became a, like a family friend, you know. But uh, the other guys went off and uh, sought their fortune, didn't they? They certainly did. <laughs> Aye. Uh, um, tell, tell us a little, you've got this um, exhibition coming up. Yes. Uh, when, when is it? So it's it's taken August. 30 years, Dave, <laughs> for me to, to meet, meet a person who, who had the same uh, 
idea that I did it, how it should be released. 20, 26th of August. It's yeah, the, the 26th um, of August, which part is of international, per, per, Part of International Beetle Week. That's right. I'd imagine, obviously, up, it's going to be up in Liverpool then. Indeed, yeah. yeah. It'll be in the Adelphi Hotel on the Sunday, the 26th. Beetle Week's from the 22nd to the 28th, you know, all over the city. Right. And then on the Beatles convention day, they take over the whole Adelphi Hotel there in the middle of the city. Right. And, um, you know, there's a big sale area with vinyl and, you know, memorabilia. And then there's lots of bands playing in different rooms from all around the world playing Beatles stuff. People are just milling about, chatting, you know, having a nice time. And then there's a, con a room where they, they get guest speakers. You know, I think Tony Bramwell's going to be there this year, Patty Boyd, Mark Lewison. And then um, we're in the Empire Room. We've got the whole Empire Room where we're going to launch our um, four CD set, uh, boxed set of um, the Percy Phillips Studio Collection, containing 70 recordings from, you know, from those uh, early family messages and a Rose Queen ceremony, and then the early rock and roll, and then through into mm -hmm. the 60s where people were coming in doing Paul Simon songs and. Uh, Marmalade songs yeah. and there. Uh, and most of these, I guess, had never been released before. Never been released before, no. Interesting. And um, and also Ken Dodd, of course, who we, we, I think you mentioned oh, him yeah. earlier. Yeah. But uh, he became a good family friend because they, they lived in Naughty Ashes, you know, That's and his right, dad yeah. ran a coal yard. <laughs> so he was a fellow <laughs> businessman with uh, my grandpa. Yeah. So they knew each other. So Ken started coming to the to the studio a lot, and uh, my grandpa just loved his singing voice so. He made a few discs, his yeah. first ever disc he recorded there, and that has never been heard publicly, and it will be on the CD, uh, both sides of that disc. Yeah. Doddy singing, and um, Grandma on the piano. Right. And, the and God bless him, eh, because uh, it's sad that he won't be able to be there. Absolutely. He, uh, died earlier this year. And the Everton Football Club songs? <laughs> yeah, that's a strange one, isn't it? Because... It was just there in the in the archive that Grandpa yeah. had kept, and that's a, a seven inch forty five, yeah. and that, that was recorded in nineteen sixty three by the Everton team, who had won the title, the league title that year, and they came into the studio, the whole team, with a professional singer, an accordionist, a guy on the piano, and a drummer, <laughs> and they they recorded this specially written pop song called uh, E V E R T O N. <laughs> It's really good, and it lists where all the fans come from in Liverpool, you know, Heighton or Walton or whatever. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there it is, really good quality as well. The, the recording sounds excellent, and there's a, a song on the B-side as well. So that that's on the recording as well. Brilliant. On the CD. Because the quarry men are still gigging, aren't they? So I yeah, see they them are. advertising Colin's still themselves. on drums, yeah. yeah. John Lowe on piano, Rod Davis on banjo, Len Gary, who was in the original uh, quarry men, yeah. singing. Sounds like Elvis, he's brilliant, Len Gary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are they playing at all at the Beatles convention or at your Well, opening? John Lowe's coming along to the convention. I think they're otherwise occupied, uh, the other guys, but yeah. there's only John and Colin the drummer who appeared on the, the Percy Phillips recording anyway. That's right. But also, uh, what we're putting out with the CD, we're putting out uh, a limited, additional, uh, limited edition 10-inch vinyl double album. Brilliant. With the, the, the pick of the best, um, the best 33 tracks are on that. Yeah. So that's just a, uh, limited to 500 and that's 10 inch, you know, yeah. so that's another special thing. I'm, I'm so pleased that after all these years, what happened was, I'll tell you briefly, Dave and Derek, but um, there was this fella called Pete Goodall, yeah. and he, he runs Speakeasy Records, recordings, a record company that I've signed to that they are releasing the uh, studio collection. And I got a phone call from him one day about 18 months ago. And it turned out that he made his first record in 1963 in the studio with his band, Sava and the Democrats. And Pete went on to move to London and get in with, like, Georgie Fame and Zoop Money and all that lot. And he went on to be in Thunderclap Newman. They did Something in the Air, you know, yeah. that yeah. wonderful anthem. Absolutely. He did Kung Fu Fighting. <laughs> he was in the drugs <laughs> for quite a while. And, you know, he was one of those guys like Tex Makins on bass who they... They were always in Abbey Road doing backing tracks, you know, for pop songs and that. Yeah. So anyway, so that's where Pete started at Grandpa's studio. So I invited him over and he came over. And in my collection, Dave, you won't believe it, but I had this 7-inch 45 yeah. with these four songs on, Shaking All Over, Love Me Like a Hurricane and two others. Really good covers, you know, with the bass, drums, guitar and piano. Really nice, tight recordings from 1963. And I didn't know who it was. 
And it, it turned out this disc that was in my collection was the disc that Pete had made in 1963. Mm -hmm. So um, we ended up, um, you know, forming a plan and uh, signing a contract and it's speakeasy recordings who have put the uh, put this uh, project together the CD. So, so you're obviously going to be at is it the Adelphi did you say in Liverpool yeah in the Empire in the Empire room yeah we'll at be the there Adelphi. I think we open at 11 I'm giving a short okay. presentation to the convention okay. about half 10 okay. and we've also had a new plaque commissioned because as you mentioned the old one there uh, has got a couple of mistakes and, it, and is it is it can anyone go Oh, yeah, the convention's open to the public, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Is, it, is, is there an entry day. fee, or do you just... Yeah, there is an entrance fee, yeah, I think yeah. it's 20 quid. Right. But, uh, not to our exhibition, but I think it's 20 quid to get into the whole convention. The whole thing, you know, and, and then, then you can do whatever you like once you're in there. That, yeah. It's fantastic, absolutely. But, uh, um, we can't control that, unfortunately. No. Uh, you know, they have to make their money, don't they? Yeah. Did, did the Beatles ever try and uh, use those two recordings to get a record deal? Because that's what a lot <laughs> yeah. of people do. That's a good question, isn't it? Because a lot of the other people who used the studio did that very mm. thing, yeah, particularly Billy Fiore, but loads of the bands that went in there in the early 60s. But um, as far as I know, no, they just enjoyed it between them. And then um, it got lost as far as they... Because, you know, there is a, a sad um, side to the tale, and it was only a couple of days after that uh, they made that recording that John's mum was That's killed right, in a so. road accident. That's right. And so you can imagine that, you know, there'd be a lot of turmoil at that time. The, that, that was the sort of end of the Quarrymen, in a way. You know, I think yeah. Stu Sutcliffe joined, like some months later Shortly after, that's and right. then they became the Beatles you know yeah and um so that was the sort of end of the Quarrymen and and John Lowe ended up keeping it you know and yeah. they just weren't aware that it had any value and I remember Paul saying that, he, that and I think he said publicly as well that when the Beatles were touring they sometimes used to say well, remember that record we made you know when we were <laughs> in Liverpool in the Quarrymen wonder what ever happened to that so Paul must have been truly astonished when he ended up Absolutely. owning it himself, you know well, it's lucky he found out about the auction. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Pina, um, time has beaten us, I'm afraid. Ah, oh, well. Yeah. Um, we're about a minute to nine. I want, I want to get the, uh, I want to get the other track in as well, in of spite course. of all the danger. Um, it's been an absolute joy talking to you. You're obviously, you're, an, you're, you know, you're a wonderful orator, uh, and your, your knowledge of, of, of your subject is first class. So, uh, oh, well, thanks very much, Dave. And thanks, so thanks much. Derek, as well. It's been great chatting you. It does feel like we could continue, doesn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> it, well, you, you know, I mean, I've got, you, is, uh, I've got your number. You never know. Right. I mean, I, I can uh, perhaps. I, t I tell you what I'll do. Oh. Uh, if you're a chair, I'll give you I'll give you a ring and we'll try and get you on again um just prior to you to the convention. Are you... I will let's him that's in about six weeks' time. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be close, nice if we perhaps time. did it the week before. Yeah, sure, I'd, I'd love that, Dave. Thanks very much. I just hope I'm about, because I know I'm on holiday sometime in <laughs> August, but and I can't oh, for the life of me remember when it is. <laughs> the weather's like we're all on holiday. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll let you, by then I can let you have a couple of uh, clips from tracks, I would think, as well. That would, be, that would be one. Um, um, Peter? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Thanks all right, you. thanks very much, Dave. Thanks, Derek. All the best to you, and all the best to your listeners as well. Thanks very much, and Dave. to you, mate. Great to talk um, to you. From those early original recordings at uh, Percy Phillips Studio up there in Liverpool, this is the Quarrymen, and in spite of all the danger.